يا حسين 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 يا حسين 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 يا حسين 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 يا حسين 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 أنت إمامي إليك انتمائي منك قريب في كربلاء في كربلاء صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتحدون الذي لا يضركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا والطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ظهر الفصاد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوه لعلهم يرجعون صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه The Islamic philosophy on minimalism has been our ongoing topic. Tonight is lecture number six. The attempt since day number one has been for us to understand that there is a certain conscious life to be lived in this world. And that life is one where we must be aware of what we possess, how we possess it, how much of it we possess, and of our consumption as well. So these terms that you've been hearing from me is now for almost a week of minimalism and conscious consumption and sustainable consumption, all truly point to a mindset. Sometimes we hear the idea of living a minimalist life and you think that that life is one that's depriving me of the finer things in life that I can't possess, I can't want, I can't desire, I can't consume as I wish. And so it becomes a very negative connotation for a lot of us. So we end up running away from this lifestyle. And from day number one, I have attempted now to explain to myself and to all of you that that's not the case. It's not a set of rules. It's not a matter of you counting your assets in your home it is a mindset where now the focus is no longer on what I possess, but the focus is on attaching the proper value to what I possess. And to actually begin to enjoy what I have as opposed to always think about what I don't have. And in the process, life becomes a little bit less stressful and a little bit more fulfilled. And that's really what we're after, right? We're after this equation where life reduces the stress on me and increases the fulfillment on me. Well, part of that equation can be um, reached by us living this life of a minimalist. Now, last night we spoke a little bit about individualism. We talked about the fact that our consumption has to be through this idea that we belong to a greater good, a greater body, a greater ummah. And because of that, we must always understand that the way we consume in this world and how we possess in this world, we must keep in mind that it's not just about me, myself, and I. 
but rather it's the idea that I have to understand that I belong to a greater good, a greater nation, especially within the Islamic context where it's always been about the ummah at large. Where it's just not about us, the individual. We cannot enter this idea of consumption with the basis of this selfishness that I am the one that has achieved this. I worked very hard to attain this status and now I can you know, consume as I wish and possess as I wish. No, not the case at all. We have to understand that there is a brother beside me, a sister in front of me who has their rights on me as well. Now one point I wanted to make that was pointed out to me and I really appreciate the feedback was in my discussion last night, I talked about the idea that we should have this culture inside of our communities where we should, you know, reach out to one another. Maybe even try to ask them about what's happening in their life. Now naturally, my intention was to help. It wasn't so I can get the nitty gritty details of what's happening with you and your wife or you and your husband or what happened with your daughter's divorce or what happened with your son running away, blah, 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 so I can go out and spread that to others. No, God forbid, of course not. That wasn't my point and that's not what I was promoting yesterday. But rather the idea was that when, you know, when life does throw its hardship at us, it's a little bit easier when I feel like I have a team around me that's there to help me out of this difficulty. So God forbid we're one of those people in our communities that, you know, if I want to know anything about any home, I can ask this person or that person. This person knows everything about everybody. If, God forbid, you are one of those people that are known for that in the community, then may Allah protect you. Please avoid those things. We don't want to be those individuals where people, the moment that we open our mouth, people are scared what might come out of our mouth. May Allah protect us from that, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa Moving along with the individualism now, if we understand that, yes, I belong to a greater body, a greater brotherhood, a greater sisterhood, where everything I, I, I do and how I live should affect everybody around me, then naturally the next link in this chain of this ashra is to talk about desire. And talk about this idea of the need we have inside of us. Now before I do that, let me give you a little bit of a context and to make sure that I don't, I don't present it incorrectly. We know that there are certain powers inside of our internal kingdom. That much we know. All of you, mashallah, like I said, are, are, are very intelligent, very learned. You know that within the department or within the powers of the, of the human being, there are four major powers. al quwwat ghadabiya shahwiyah, wahmiyah, aqaliyah. Correct? If I had time and I don't, I'd go through every single of four of them. But it's enough to know that we have this power of attraction, the power of repulsion, the power of creativity, and the power of the intellect. Now two of them, meaning ghadab and shahwa, anger and desire, has been with us since day number one in this world. Okay? The moment that a baby exits the womb of their mother, and they begin to cry, now there is philosophy why that baby cries according to hadith, but one of, the, one of it is that either it's hungry or it wants you know, the warmth of the mother or it wants something. So it's crying now to inform you that it wants something. And as the baby gets a little bit older, a couple of days in, a few months in, really ultimately when that baby cries, it cries for three reasons if you ask me. Either it's hungry or it's sleepy or it's diaper needs changing. Meaning what? It knows what it wants, it knows what it doesn't want. It desires food, it wants to sleep, it wants a clean diaper. It can't say a single word, it can't even talk, sometimes it can't even open its eyes. It doesn't have 20-20 vision, but it has that desire inside of them. 
Now later on now, for example, if you try to give a baby milk when really it's sleepy, it will sit there and tell you, I don't want the milk. So either it will shake its head, or it will hit your hand, or take the bottle and throw it across the room. To let you know that it's not food, I want to be put to bed, I'm sleepy. So not only is there desire, there's a little bit of anger there as well. At the age of, you know what, three, four, five months, can't say a single word, but oh man, they communicate very well. And this goes along, goes along until a person becomes baligh or baligha. And one of the signs of balugh is not just jismi, it's not just the body changing, but the aql now begins to wake up a little bit. And this intellect now begins to wake up a little bit. And the intellect is there to, to be strengthened to the point where now it governs over the faculties and the powers of shahwa and ghadab, of that desire and that anger. That's a quick akhlaqi lesson 101. And we spend our entire life in trying to empower this intellect and reasoning to make sure that it is the CEO of the company and that the anger and the desire reports back up to the aql, not the other way around. But this desire now has been with you since day number one. And depending on how we feed that desire, either it's very hungry and very strong, or you have tamed the beast that Imam Ali refers to. But part of the reason why this life of minimalism is sometimes so difficult, or part of the reason why we have adopted this life of possession and overconsumption, is because we want that life. Our internal kingdom desires that life. We have a nafs that's asking us, begging us for more. And we simply say, okay. And maybe someone like me, maybe I've never entertained the idea that it's okay to say no to myself. Because you know, the, as a side note, the reason why we're known as you know, a very strange creation, we're very ajib as they say. And strange of course in the, in the sense that we're very unique, maybe that's a better word, not strange. We're a very unique creation, the human being, such that as one of my ustads would, you, you used to describe to me, he says, you know, in a, in a battlefield, in a war, you have two armies, right? Two armies. And there are commanders of both armies that are two distinct individuals. Okay? Person A is leading or commanding this army A. Person B is commanding this army B. Okay? And they have their each motives, their different motives, and they, of course, when it come, come, comes time to attack, they listen to what their commander said so. It's two different armies, two different commanders. But the human being is so unique that, yes, there's two different armies inside of us, A and B, but there's one commander. It's us. And we command that army A, we command that army B. We command the angelic, theistic army inside of us. We also command the animalistic and hewani, nafsi army inside of us as well. We're the commander in charge. And depending on which army you feed, that's the army that will be victorious. It's a very simple location. The example I give you is this microphone. I have to use my, this example. This microphone right now is on. Okay? And somewhere in this building is a microphone, is, is a control for the volume. Okay? Now I want you to imagine that the, that, that, that the volume of the microphone has been reduced now to one. One of ten. Ten being the loudest, one being of course the softest. It's been down to one. Now no matter how much I try to, 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 to talk as loud as I can, the guys way off in the back now will always sit there and say, we can't. Hear you, Malana. If the volume was put up to 10, the max, I could whisper to you and you could still hear me. All the way in the back because the volume's on 10. Doesn't matter how low I whisper, you can still hear me. We also, just to kind of take the, the, the example further, we also have our own mic controls inside of us. Okay? There's a mic control for our animalistic dimension. 
There's a mic control for our angelic dimension. There's a mic control for the nafs inside of us that houses these, uh, these animalistic instincts inside of us, what we desire, what we lust, what we want, how our anger. And then there is that angelic side. When nafaktu fihi min ruhi, Allah says, that is that angelic side. And the volume control is up to us such that if we put, let's say for example, the animalistic volume on one, that animalistic dimension could scream at us, we won't hear it or it won't impact us. Or we put the angelic side all the way to 10 and Allah could simply whisper to us and we'll go running. Or the flip side could happen, God forbid. That the angelic volume is down all the way to one, Allah is screaming at us, the prophets are screaming at us, the imams are screaming at us, the parents are screaming at us, the Quran is screaming at us, the ulama are screaming at us, but nothing, we can't hear you. Or the animalistic dimension is all the way up to ten, that one small whisper by shaitan and we say labbaik. But, but that control is in our hands. It's in our hands. We have to stop thinking for a second that I'm not in control here, Malana. Shaitan made me do it. Shaitan will say, hold on now, wait a second now, brother. I don't have control over you. I don't have that sultanat over you. I can't force you and grab you by the hand or drag you or push your car to where you want to go. No, I can whisper to you. But the matter is, how high is that volume? So tonight, let's, ex let, let's explore this a little bit. Let's look at this a little bit and see what's going on. Before that, now, if you can, please, with one loud salawat, move up as much as you can. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So now we have this power of desire inside of us. And not everything we desire is evil. Let me also make this point in the beginning as well. I'm going slow, I'm sorry, but you know, you've been very patient. I ask for that same patience tonight. Everything we desire is not evil. Okay? Desiring, let's say, for example, affection from your spouse, desiring, for example, acceptance from your parents, desiring, for example, a good friend, for example, this, all those things reside inside our shahwa. Okay? Not everything that comes from that department is all evil. But it is a beast that needs to be governed and tamed, Imam Ali says. And if you continue to feed it every time it asks for food, it'll get bigger and bigger to the point where number one, not only can you not feed it anymore, but then it begins to devour you. It needs to be tamed and controlled. Okay? Which means that sometimes, once in a while, we need to say no to our desires. And I'll, you know, I'll back this up with some very, very powerful ahadis. The first one that I want to share with you is from Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salatu wa salam. He actually, in Kafi, he reports this from the Holy Prophet who actually says, Allahu Azza wa Jal. So this hadith is a hadith Qudsi. Okay, it's a hadith that, like I said a couple of nights ago, that is directly from Allah onto the Holy Prophet, through the fifth Imam onto you and I. And he says that, Allah says, he describes two different states. The first state, he says, يُؤْثُرُ عَبْدُ الْحَوَاهُ عَلَى حَوَايَا Okay? They're the first state he describes is that state where the believer, the abd, the slave, prefers their own desires over my wishes. حَوَاهُ عَلَى حَوَايَا Meaning when you reach a junction in your path, and we reach junctions all the time, right? Almost on an hourly basis. One path leads towards what I want. One path leads towards what God wants. Sometimes that path is one, it's very easy. Sometimes that path are two separate paths. And we have to, at that moment, at that junction, make a very, very good decision. Now, Allah says the one who chooses his hawa or her hawa or her desires and here when I say hawa, I mean those carnal desires that are made to destroy us. So keep in mind, anywhere I say hawa or the nafs, it means those animalistic desires that really are there to destroy us. I don't mean having a nice home 
or a loving wife or whatever. No, of course not. Let's keep that in mind. When that happens, he says, Allah says, when a person decides to go down the path of their hawa and ignore my desires, certain things occur in their life, very carefully. The first thing he says is that there is confusion in their affairs in life. The things that are very simple for those who are in tune with Allah are very confusing for them, number one. Number two, he says, they're baffled by life. They're overwhelmed by life. They're drowning in life. Because now they're up against this beast inside of them that they can't keep up with. Possess this, possess this, possess this, have this, buy this. And they try to create this life that they really can, you know, have no business creating. In the meantime their, credit, in the meantime, their credit cards are maxed, their line of credit is maxed, everything is maxed. And the amount of stress they have in simply trying to uphold, just maintain a lifestyle, is enormous. Because they had no business initially creating that life to begin with. So they are baffled by life, overwhelmed by life, the hadith says. And the third thing is that because they're baffled by life, their heart is preoccupied with this life. Preoccupied. All they can think about is how can I maintain this life now that I've really presented to everybody, this is how we live. These are my possessions, these are my vacations, these are my cars, this is my wardrobe, this is my lifestyle. Right? Fake it till you make it, as they say. That's on one side. On the other side, he says, then there are those yu'thudu abadu hawaya ala hawahu. Allahu Akbar. Then there are those servants who actually prefer my wishes over their own desires. Complete opposite. Meaning what? At that junction now, you choose the path of Allah. And you ignore the path of your carnal desires. What does he say about that? The first thing is, he says, that my angels protect them. Now it's not clear in the hadith how that protection is. It's enough to know that there is a process of protection. Number two, he says, the risk in the samawat wal ardin, in the heavens and the earth, are guaranteed. Number three, those are my businessmen in the audience who are running their own business, my entrepreneurs. Listen very carefully. Allah Himself says that when you choose my wishes over your desires, I will build your business myself. <laughs> he uses the word tajir. I'll make sure your tijarat is booming, that Q1 earnings are good. And the fourth one that blew my mind when I read this hadith, he says, the one who prefers my wishes over his desires, he says, atathul dunya, I will bring the dunya to them. Oh my goodness. I will bring the dunya to them. You don't need to chase the dunya or chase possessions or chase this lifestyle. Allah says, I'll bring it to you, provided what? Hawaya ala hawahu. And because you are so occupied with Allah, the dunya will come and fall at your feet and say, please follow me, please follow me. And while you achieve the dunya, you won't attach yourself to the dunya. Part two to this lecture tomorrow, my shameless plug for tomorrow is the idea that we will talk about, as I promised to many of you, Zuhud tomorrow, attachment versus achievement. But before the sequel, you have to understand the prequel first. Look at this hadith, what is Allah telling us? That here you are now, here I am, trying to chase possessions in this dunya, trying to build my assets, trying to create a lifestyle, just to show, really, a life of fallacy, that I have no business living. And I want to do it somehow, with the hopes that I can still hold on to God as well. And we understand that we can't have it both. We can't have it both. 
And he's saying, if you are somebody who ignores my wishes and follows your desires, everything that your nafs says, I want this, yes sir, I want this, yes sir, I want this, yes sir, gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, then you end up chasing the dinner. You might have the best of the best of the best, but that contentment I talked about days ago, that's nowhere to be found. There's bewilderment. You're baffled, you're overwhelmed, you're drowning, but you have everything you want. Good for you, Shabash, Mubarak. Is it worth it? On the other side, Allah says, look, that very dunya you're chasing, I'll bring it to you. Just prefer my wishes over your desires. I will bring it to you. Atathul dunya. I, ah, I will bring it to you. Meaning what? That we can have both of these worlds if we simply stop and understand that as difficult as it is, as difficult as it is sometimes to choose the path of God over anything else, that's the path that we want. If we want the best of both worlds, the best of both worlds, it has to go through the path of Allah's wishes. The maqam and the level that Imam Hussein reached was not easy. He reached that through Azim sacrifice. His al wasn't near and dear to him. His al was not near and dear to him. His Qasim was not near and dear to him. Of course they were. But the deen of Allah is asking for something else and he gave everything on that path to the point where now he is rewarded in this world and of course he's Ravi in that world as well. It requires a sacrifice and that's the word that I need all of us to understand. It requires a sacrifice. It requires all of us to live a little bit away from the norm. If the entire world is going upstream, the river, you have to be, we have to be that individual who fights against the stream sometimes. The example I often give is that imagine this entire room was filled with people who wore white t-shirts, white t-shirts. And you walk in with a bright red t-shirt on. You're like, look at this guy. Didn't get the memo, the memo that today is white t-shirt day. And you stand out. The moment you walk in through that door all the way here, all eyes are on you. Because you stand out. You are distinct from everybody else. What this hadith is asking us to do, that in this era of moral bankruptcy, in this era of overconsumption and consumerism, for you to be that red shirt amongst white shirts. And it's difficult. I totally get it. It's very, very hard. It's very, very hard. It requires courage. It requires an immense amount of sacrifice. But look at what you're getting. You're getting everything you want in this world handed to you by God. And inshallah, you have a nice akhirat waiting for you as well. All from Allah Himself, nobody else. Because this heart that's preoccupied sometimes with this world, this heart wasn't meant for anything else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. He says in a very irfani tradition, Al-Qalbu haram Allah wa la tuskin haram Allah ghayr Allah. The sanctuary, the haram of Allah is the heart of the human being. Right? I often say the haram of Imam Hussein in Karbala, the haram of Imam Ali in Najaf, the haram of Imam Radha in Mashhad, the haram of Allah for my youth are your, is your heart. That's Allah's sanctuary. وَلَا تُسْكِنْ حَرَمَ اللَّهِ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ Do not allow anyone to reside in that haram except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'll give you a very simple example. I want you to imagine now, just you know, keep the very simple examples in mind, that I land in Dar es Salaam, I landed last week, and Muhammad Bai was there for my, for my istiqbal. He picks me up, said, welcome to Dar es Salaam. And he takes me to where I'm staying. And he gives me the key, and I open the door, and I open the door, and I see that the bed now is not made at the side table now, there's someone else's medication, someone else's charger, a bottle of water that's half full. I open the closet, there's already, you know, clothing in there. 
There's half bitten, half eaten food inside the fridge. There's somebody's shoes there, open the bathroom, somebody's toothbrush is there. I said, Muhammad Bai, there's someone else already living in here. There's no room for me in here. Until he takes me into another room that's completely empty, and I begin now to move myself in. I hang my kanzus, and I plug in my charger, I plug in my laptop, you know. I have my snacks beside me, I have my fridge full, everything is there. Such that if somebody was to walk into my room and say, okay, Sayyid Asad lives here, Sayyid Asad is staying here. I could tell, you know, these kanzus are six foot four, they're really long kanzus. I know it's him, it has to be him. Same black hat everywhere he goes. It's him, it has to be him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the door to our hearts. He sees everything else. He sees pictures on the wall. He sees this, the bed is not made. There's clothes hanging in the closet. He sees grudges from 10 years ago. He sees resentment. He sees the dunya. And he says to himself, this heart is full, there's no room for me in here. When Imam Ali says to stand at the door of your heart and not let anyone in, that's what he means, that heart is the haram of Allah. This hadith is telling us that when we ignore the wishes of Allah and begin to say labayk to everything my desires tell me, then I preoccupy that heart. I fill that heart up with everything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those become anchors to us in going and moving towards Allah. It's very dangerous. We begin to say yes to Allah no matter how difficult it is. Slowly, small things, small things. Sometimes it takes us to crawl towards Allah. Just a movement towards Allah and He promises He'll do everything else. I'm not here to make things hopeless. I'm here to make things hopeful for all of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obsessed with your success. I always say that. He wants nothing more than moments of pride for him. Hadith says that when a youngster falls in the sajda, falls in the sajda, subhana rabbi ala wa bihamdi, surrounded by shayateen, surrounded by so many paths and ways to move away from Allah, and he decides to put his forehead on the ground and praise Allah, Allah summons the angels. Let's look at this 16 year old child. Look at what he's doing right now. He has every, every possibility, every potential to now go down this shaitan route and that shaitan route. And he decides now to come on a Thursday night, dead tired, in a mud of Imam Hussein to listen to someone like me. Those are signs to God that God, I'm trying. It's difficult. He knows it's difficult. That's why he says that, you know, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ittaqullahu wa abtughul ilayhi al-wasirata wa jahidu fi sabilihi la'allakum tuflihoon That all you who believe, be conscious of Allah, seek Allah through another source and struggle on His path. Struggle on His path so you may be included amongst those who are successful. You know, we live in a world that success is measured by results. Success is measured by results, right? You go to a, you, you go to a company and you, 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 know, you put your resume in front of them and they look at your education. And they say, and you have written your education, I didn't pass my university, but I tried really, really, really hard. Would you accept that, that resume? They say, thank you very much. You go on a pile of 400 rejected resumes. But you really did try hard, you just, you just couldn't pass, you couldn't obtain your degree. But this society is all result driven. And sometimes we think that my success is based on my results. And maybe in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of Allah, it's all based on our struggle. To the point where he says, look at his grace. He says, even if you intend to do something good and you don't do it, I'll still reward you. Just intend to do something good. Now, if you actually carry out that great, then that reward has 10 times more. That's the grace of Allah. He just wants to see the struggle. And what I'm asking all of you to do from day number one is struggle. I'm not pretending like it's easy. 
This hadith is telling us so much. You could have the dunya and the akhirat, but you have to choose Allah's path. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. That's point number one. Point number two, a hadith by Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salam. Again in Kafi, Imam Ali says, I fear for you two things. Subservience to your desires, your hawa, again the word hawa comes now, and this idea of delusional hope is the best transition I have for you. Delusional hope. I won't touch the delusional hope, I'll touch the first part. The idea of what? The idea of subservience to your desires. Meaning you are now become subservient to your hawa. Whatever your nafs says, whatever my nafs says, I say yes. It's a very dangerous statement, you know. Um, Imam Khomeini in, in his Chayla Hadith, he attributes it to the Holy Prophet, but doesn't quite mention if it's a Hadith or not. Anyways. It's a statement that's very, very powerful, connected to this hadith. The statement is, Inna shayat, inna shaytani amanu biyadi. Allahu Akbar. He says that surely my shaytan, my individual inner shaytan, has become the path of my faith now. Biyadi, with my own hands. Meaning this power inside of me, this nafsani power inside of me, this animalistic power inside of me, meant for something else, now has become an avenue of my faith. Where not only am I saying yes to it, I'm subservient to it. Inna shaytani amanu biyadi. This inner shaytan, my shaytan, everyone has their own personal shaytan, right? Everybody has that list of things that pulls them off the path. Mine is not yours, yours is not mine. Shaitan knows each of us very, very well. He knows exactly what carrot to dangle in front of us. He knows how to pull us off the path. That's your own shaitan. Inna shaitani amanu biyadi. From my own hands, I've allowed this shaitan now to what? To lead me on this path of destruction. Amir al-Mu'maneen says, I fear for you two things. One is this subservience to your desires. Amma, he says, Amma, ittaba al hawa, fa innahu yasuddu an al haq. Please, very carefully. As for this idea of being subservient to Allah, the result of you being subservient to your desires is yasuddu an al haq. Again, in the shara'a, this hadith Imam Khomeini, rahmatullah alayhi, says that yasuddu has many meanings in Arabic. One of them is that it prevents you, it prevents you from reaching the truth. Now I've been here in Dar es Salaam for almost a week now. You are all with me inshallah, yes? Front to back, left to right, inshallah, yes? Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. I've been here now for almost a week. And I have had the pleasure really of talking to many, many of our youth here. Either after the majlis, sitting down, one-on-one, -on -one, over telephone conversations, over WhatsApp conversations, over the phone, over email. And the one thing that I'm, I'm gathering in my limited time here, mind you, is that they have accepted the fact that they are entrenched in a battle right now. And it's so inspiring for someone like me to see that. Wallahi it is. It's so incredible that by the time I entered this hall, these beautiful kids in front of me are rushing to the front. And they sit here. Some have books taking notes. Some have headbands wrapped around their forehead. Some have scarves wrapped around their, their neck. And they're coming and they're trying to listen to whatever they can and to, and, and, and to gain from whatever they can from this member. The emails I've received where people have boldly now, boldly now, shared with me what their struggles are. 
And sometimes my older generation, sometimes, you know, they don't understand that because they, they came from a culture where that was blasphemy. It really was. Think about your time, your time growing up, either here or in India, Pakistan. My father, Marhum, would tell me all the time that when I was younger, if I was confused about something from the majlis, and I even thought about for a moment, let me go ask the Molana afterwards. No way. Forget it. If I had the gall to go and ask him, Molana, I'm a little bit confused. Can you explain this point again? He'll say, which one is your father? Call him to me. I'll tell your father, teach your boy some manners. There wasn't that culture to come and talk to an alim. Not, I mean, not, not knocking him, but that just culture wasn't there. So whatever was told of you or, or, or said to you, just accepted. And it'll make sense to us later on. This is not this generation. This is the high, why, by the generation. It's the yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but generation. And I personally love it. I love it. Because you can tell they're just trying to figure things out. Look, I'll give you a very simple example. Simple man, simple examples. You're driving to your destination, you're on a long road trip. Halfway through the, conver halfway through the, 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 the drive, you feel for some reason that I'm not going in the right direction. Those landmarks that I'm used to aren't there. It doesn't feel right. So now you have two choices, right? You can either keep going, Chalo, yeah, let's see what happens. Right? Let's see what happens. Now two hours later, you realize that, oh my God, I'm completely lost, and now I'm further from my destination. Or the second thing is to pull over to the side, sh shut off the car, stop and ask yourself, first of all, where am I right now? And where do I need to go? A U-turn, a left turn, or a right turn? The second idea is far more wiser. A lot of these kids today have pulled their car over to the side. And have stopped and asked themselves, what, where am I going? What am I doing here? What is all this? And that's not blasphemy. It's actually very wise if you ask me. And they reach out to someone like me and say, look, I don't understand these things. And not, not this idea to be somebody who, you know, who's rebellious or wants, or, 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 or God forbid, an enemy of Allah. They legitimately want to know what the actual right path is. It's beautiful. I ask my parents, I ask my teachers in the audience, embrace that from this generation. They're very inquisitive, they're very curious. It should be an inspiration for us that a 15 year old now is rocking his brain about God. At 15 I was working on my jump shot. It's still no good, but I was still working on my, at 15 years old. These guys are, are asking me about you know, free will and predestination at 15 years old. And with the hope that I just want to make sure that I'm getting it right. I don't want to drive two more hours knowing full well it doesn't feel right. But once it feels right, once I know it's the path, that's it. I cannot be stopped. I'm getting to my destination. But yes, it's okay. I'm sorry if you stop the car on the, on the side road for a moment, figure out my GPS, where am I? Make your U-turn and make your way to your destination. That's not blasphemy. Sometimes one step back is three steps forward. It's so inspirational for me. It's so hopeful to me. Like wherever I go, I hear doom and gloom, doom and gloom. Our youth are gone, our youth are gone, our youth are gone. Wait a second now. They're not always gone. They're just trying to figure things out. And at least they're trying to reach out to the right sources to figure out what should I be doing. Now this hadith tells us that if you want to go down that path, you cannot be those ittaba'ul hawa. He says very, very openly, Amir al that one of the things that prevents you from where you want to go is your subservience to your desire. It's to constantly say yes and yes and yes and yes and yes to whatever you want. No. Because eventually when you say no to your desires, it weakens a little bit more. And when you increase the volume to the mic of your God, it gets louder and louder and then drowns out that volume inside of you. That's why the same Holy Prophet says, the strongest of you, inna shadida, laysa man nas, the strongest of you is not the one who overpowers individuals. Walakin shadidan ghalaba ala nafsihi. The strongest of you is the one who overpowers his desires. 
His desire is screaming at him, screaming at her. He says, no, thank you. I choose the path of Allah. One more example than Messiah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The examples are in front of us. We have signs everywhere. Sometimes we can't pick up those signs. Sometimes we don't even know their signs. You know, there's a, there's a little, you know, it's a story. It's not really a hadith. It's a story that we have in our books. Where this man and Malik al Mult have a conversation. The angel of death and this man have a conversation. And the man says to the angel of death that, look, when you come to get my soul, I won't bother you. Provided you tell me you're coming. Just give me a heads up. OMW on my way. Whatever, just text me. You'll sure, no problem. No problem. I'll let you know. Years and years and years and pass, and the knock on the door. Angel of death. Well, he won't knock, he'll just come right in. He'll say, Let's go, it's time to go. It's time for you to start your path. He goes, Whoa, 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 we had a deal. You never told me you were coming. I'm not prepared for this. He says, I never told you. I sent you sign after sign after sign. Your back is a little bit bent, not a sign. Your hairs are turning white, not a sign. Your knees crack, not a sign. You buried your own father, not a sign. You buried your young, not a sign. You were diagnosed with cancer. You fought cancer. You're now in remission, not a sign. Signs everywhere. We have to accept them as signs. In this discussion on desire, one of the biggest signs we have is the month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shahr al-Ramadan, the miracle month of the Islamic calendar. Primary example for us when it comes to this discussion. Think about it for a moment. 15, 16, I don't know, I don't know about how fasting is here, but right now in the heat of the summer in Toronto, we're talking about an 18 hour fast. Iftar is at 9 p.m. Suhoor is at 4 p.m., 4 a.m. By 6 or 7 p.m., don't talk to me, don't look at me, don't call me. I'm going to try to sleep. This is just don't. Not time for jokes, not time for anything. Now imagine a sister, a girl who just turned baligha, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. Now Bachari, her first Ramadan is an 18-hour fast. It's very difficult. But one thing you'll notice in the month of Ramadan is these kids power through that fast. It's a challenge to them. They won't run to the musalla, but they'll wake up for sahri. Now in that fast now, there comes a moment where everybody gets hungry and thirsty, right? Now you'll ask each other, are you thirsty? No, I'm not thirsty. Yeah, you are. You are thirsty. You are hungry. Stop lying to yourself. You're starving right now. Now I want you to imagine in the middle of the day now nobody is home and mashallah the fridge is full with yesterday's niyaz. And no one is there. There's no cameras hopefully in your kitchen set up. Hopefully. If there are, come and talk to me. And you decide to go open Open that fridge, open up that foil, grab that non-kebab, have a little bit of a nibble, just a nibble, Baba, nobody will know. And close up that foil like, like nobody touched it. And go back upstairs. Will anybody do that? Nobody will do that. Nobody will even entertain the idea. Even though your body, your desires are screaming for food and water. But because you've chosen the path of Allah, you've said no to that desire. Now what happens in Ramadan? Because you are needless of your desires, you become needful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you've, you, you've re re released yourself of the anchors, you fly towards Allah. Think about what you do on a daily basis. The exact same 24 hours a day you have in the month of Ramadan that you have today. But somehow in that month of Ramadan, you're up a half an hour before Fajr. One juz of the Qur'an, every day the mosque, everything that you thought you could not do in the month of Allah, somehow, for some reason, you could do it. It's not because the day is longer. It's because you're different. You have focused yourself on the path to Allah and you've denied yourself that desire of food and water. And now you're flying towards Allah. You're flying towards Allah. I asked my youth out there, those of you who are looking to fly towards Allah, and all of you are, I know, part of that flight towards Allah, part of the, the, the cutting of the anchors is what? Is the idea of saying no to your desires. 
Think about astronauts who, who what? Who now crack that, 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 that wall of gravity, end up in space now. There's nothing bearing them now. Now they can move and pull themselves as they wish because those barriers and those anchors of gravity are gone. Once you elevate that high now, your movement and your, with the path of Allah becomes very, very easy. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When you look at some of these lessons of Karbala, and you look at some of the different groups that existed on the plains of Karbala in Ashura, there's one group that truly are amazing in the plains of Karbala. You know, mothers in general, mothers in general, Mothers are that existence of that creation that are not like anybody else. As fathers, we don't even come close to the maqam and the level of a mother in Islam. For obvious reasons. Our fourth imam talks about the idea that the right of your mother is to know that she carried you where no one carries anybody. That she went hungry so you could eat, that she went thirsty so you could drink, that, that she stood in the burning sun so you could lay in the cool shade, as he says. That the mother is so obsessed with their child that she would rather take on the pain than to see you in pain. When she sees you in pain, the dua is what? Allah give me the pain but relieve my son of that pain. If she could take a bullet for you, she would take a bullet for you. If it meant for her to stand up and walk back and forth with you in her arms such that you sleep, she'll do that. She'll put herself through so much pain so you could be pain free. That's the fitrat of the mother, any mother. That's why they're so special. But the mothers of Karbala are different. The mothers of Karbala are those mothers that ignored their own fitrat and sacrifice for that mission of Hussein ibn Ali. We're talking about a mother tonight that not only is okay with sacrificing her two sons, but actually prepares them for battle in the tent. Sits there in the tent and says, look, you are there to sacrifice your life for your uncle. You are not there to quench your thirst. These are who? These are 10 year olds, 11 year olds. Some say they weren't even balig. They are just small children. And Bibi Zainab is sitting there. Can you imagine the heart of a mother preparing her sons for death? It's very hard for us to understand that level. But that's that level where nothing I want matters, everything Allah want matters. And that's why you achieve that level, that status, that the shohada and the Ashab and the family of Imam Hussein reached. Ona Muhammad now approached Imam Hussein. Says, Mamu, we, we are here to ask you for ijazah to sacrifice our life. I don't know how many, you know, how many uncles here have nephews, especially from their, from their sister's side. How many mamus we have in this audience? But they're sometimes closer to us than our own kids are. Imagine now Imam Hussein is looking at these innocent, innocent children, 10 years old, 11 years old, asking for what? Asking for death. He says, I can't, I cannot, I cannot tell you to go and give your life. And when they go back disheartened to Bibi Zainab, Bibi Zainab now comes back to Imam Hussein. When Hussein sees Zainab coming towards him, he knows now that I can't. I can't. And she recalls the story. Do you remember that moment, Bahia, in Sifin? When Abbas fought in Sifin at a very young age and how proud our father, our Baba Ali was of Abbas. Do you remember that moment? He says, yes, I do. Then why are you denying me that pride for my own sons? I'm giving you ijazat as their mother. Let them go sacrifice. Let me send. How can it be that my children are left alive while you sacrifice your own children? And now the preparation begins. Keep in mind how small and young these kids are. There was not armor that could fit them. 
They couldn't fit the helmet on them. Abu Fazl on one side, Imam Hussein on the other, all of Muhammad in front of them. Somehow Imam Hussein was trying to prepare them for battle when this helmet couldn't fit them. It's at that moment that Imam Hussein now grabs an imama, ties an imama on both their heads just to make the helmet fit on them. That's how young and small they were. Now they begin to mount the horse. Imam Hussein embraces them and hugs them and kisses them for a very long time. And he watches them as they ride into the Maidan of Karbala announcing I am the son of Jafar al Tayyar the blood of Hadar al run through my veins and they fought like warriors I tell you they fought like warriors as long as it was one on one nobody could touch them but Omar ibn Sa'd realized this is not a normal khandan this is not normal blood surround the boys separate the boys so the army separated on from Muhammad began now to surround them somebody Somebody threw rocks at own. Somebody threw spears at Muhammad. Somebody threw arrows at own. There came a moment where they fell from the horse. Assalamu alaika, ya Abu Abdullah. Imam Hussein goes running. Abu Fazl Abbas goes running. They grab the bodies. They bring them back to the tent. Everyone is waiting for Zainab's reaction. The tent opens. Bibi Zainab walks slowly towards the two bodies. Own on one side, Muhammad on the other. She kneels down between them. She places one hand on the chest of Own, one hand on the chest of Muhammad, falls into sajda. Ya Allah, accept this Qalil sacrifice from me. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi Ma'atme Hussein, ya Hussein, ya Hussein.